just in a moment, but right now I want us, before we're seated, to pray. This has been a very unexpected day, but uh, as we were brainstorming, my dad and I, what to do, I had the inkling, the question was coming, and the Lord dropped what will be our text for tonight that I'll get to in a moment, but I believe I do have a word from the Lord. Thank you for the warm reception. I can tell you the nerves were high, seeing as y'all know me, but I believe the Lord has put this on my heart tonight, so let's pray that we would have hearts to receive and ears to hear what the Spirit would say to the church by the authority that is in the name of Jesus. I pray, O oh God, that, Lord, the seed of your word that is about to go forth. God, it doesn't matter who carries it. Lord, what matters is the power resides within your holy word. And I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that, God, the seed of the word would fall upon healthy soil. Soil that is full of faith. Soil that is full of expectancy. Oh, God, the hearts of people, Jesus, that are ready Oh, God, to experience all that you have for us tonight. I pray move through your word in Jesus' name. And if you're going to preach with me tonight, put your hands together and give God praise. You may be seated. Go ahead and roll that clip. I need some volume. The video you're about to see or you're seeing behind me, it's the audio isn't clear, but it's from a dramatic and tragic night for a Texas police officer. Her name was Ann Carrizales. What you saw off screen before she does the three-point turn there was on a routine traffic stop. Ann Carrizales took two bullets at point-blank range, one of them to her face, another to her Kevlar vest. During an early morning traffic stop, yet still, as you can see, at high speed, she went after the bad guy. We have a picture of Ann, I'd like to show you where she was interviewed on today, a television show, and Carrizales pulled a car over in Stafford, Texas, just outside of Houston at 3 a.m. She said her instincts told her that something was amiss as she walked up to the car with three men inside. And with seconds, the front seat passenger leaned over and began to fire in her direction. Carrizales was hit twice. A bullet went through her cheek and then once hit her vest that most likely saved her life. She fired back as she fell to the ground as that car sped off and shattered its rear window. Bleeding and in pain, she got into her squad car and she gave chase. Drifting around corners at high speeds while calling out cross streets, she took pursuit for more than 20 miles. The entire dash cam video which we have cut for brevity is nine minutes long. When asked by the interviewer why, more importantly, how, she says it wasn't an option for me to give up. The 40-year-old former Marine and mother of two told NBC's Janet Shamalin, she said, I had to stay in the fight because I'm a mom. They shot me. And they were absolutely not, absolutely not going to get away with that. Because I will do everything I can to come home to my children every day. This mom was not to be deterred. I think we've got a photo of, of this officer. If we could just cut the clip and go ahead and show that photo there. It was, she was not to be deterred. She was not to be stopped because she was passionate about her children. 
And in that moment when that bullet ripped through her cheek and another slammed into her vest with enough force to crack ribs and bruise organs, it was not her marine training. It was not her championship boxing skills. But it was her passion for her babies that were at home waiting for mom to get home from her shift that consumed her. And when that passion consumed her, there was no way that two bullets and three bad guys could ever stop her. Passion. Passion is this mysterious force. And of all the qualities that human beings uniquely possess, it is this powerful thing that stands a part of all of our cognition and logic and, and all of the other things that make a human being a human being. Passion is both difficult to describe, yet incredibly clear when it is staring you in the face. We talk about passion all the time and we describe it best with words that seem to have no logical bearing on human emotions. We, we describe it with terms like colors and temperatures like red hot or boiling with, or we describe it with basic instincts like hunger for or thirsty for. But passion is both an emotion, a desire, an act of the will, all at the same time. Churning within the heart of an individual is the deep desire of a soul that will stop at nothing. And passion consumes you. I present this story today. Because many a commentator and teacher, me included, has fallen deep into the weeds of this text. While trying to unpack one of Jesus' most famous stories, the cleansing of the temple, and lose sight of what stands out about our Lord most distinctly in this passage. And we find it in John, the second chapter. I'm going to read verses 13 through 17. I want to read 13 and 14 for you first. It says, now the Passover of the Jews was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found at the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and money changers doing business. See, here's what would happen. Is at the Passover, worshipers would come and from all over the world to worship God and the priests had established this lucrative business opportunity of exchanging foreign money for Jewish coins and selling animals needed for sacrifices as the animals would not be able to make the trek and the trip over the seas and across the various lands that people would come from. There was nothing wrong with this practice. There was nothing wrong with providing an opportunity for people to worship in a right way. The problem was where the practice was being completed. The tragedy was that we're about to see unfold is that this business, this lucrative opportunity, people, they couldn't just come to, to come to God and give an offering with coins bearing the image of pagan gods that would be idolatry to Judaism. They needed to exchange the money. They needed to get a blemished lamb from somewhere. Not everybody was a farmer. The issue was not that it was being done. The problem was where this practice was taking place. It was taking place at the court of the Gentiles in the temple. It was the place where Jews should be meeting non-Jewish seekers of God. Telling them about the Lord. Telling them about the one true God. Showing how he's the maker of heaven and earth and how his ways are right and his ways are holy and his ways are good. And that it was the place where Gentiles that were not allowed from entering in the temple. It's, it's a place where they could go and they could find truth. It was a spot created just for them that said even though you may not have come from the right at this particular time in history. The right religious family or the right pedigree. God does not want to stop you and we don't want to stop you from experiencing the Lord. But now, this court that was reserved for people that were outside trying to get inside was now filled with merchants. And when Jesus saw the state of the court of the Gentiles, verse 15 says, when he had made a whip of cords, 
He browned some rushes together and he twisted some cords together. He didn't necessarily take off his belt, but he found whatever he could. And he created this, this whip out of it. And it says he drove them out of all of the temple with sheep and oxen and poured out the money changers' money and Ovin turned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. The scene is dramatic. It's provocative. It's upsetting. Furniture is broken. Animals are running wild and making crazy noises in fear. Coins are flying through the air and flying from their scales. There, there are animal cages that are being broken because Jesus is making a disturbance. Yet all this while, standing off to the side, are the disciples. Their mouths are no doubt hanging open. This is, this is John chapter 2. This is very early in their relationship with Jesus. And they're like, are you sure this is what we want to sign up for? There's no doubt some guys, their mouths are hanging open. The more introverted and quiet ones are whispering awkward underneath their breath and trying to not make eye contact with anybody as their follower is losing his ever-loving mind, tipping tables over and, and breaking open animal cages and, and, and driving out whole large cows with horns on their heads out of the temple. This is a chaotic and crazy scene. They're no doubt watching with fear and amazement. Fear because the temple officials would not just let this go. Herod would not just let this go. Amazement also because Jesus, he's acting so decisively and almost without regard for the consequences. But as they stand there with their guts churning and their hearts pounding, at some point little sparks of a Bible verse learned at a Sabbath school a long, long time ago as little boys began to light up in their minds, bringing back to remembrance an ancient prophetic utterance from David about the Messiah and what he would be like. Because verse 17 says, Then his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. Some point as Jesus is tipping over yet another table and yet another cow is scurrying out of the temple and flashes in their mind, could this be exactly, could this be, could he be exactly who they said he would be, because this is a quote from Psalm 69, 9, where David was being persecuted for his passion for God. And, and there were elements within Israel at this time that had departed from holiness and they had departed from righteousness and they had departed from truth. And he was the last one there standing and he was, he was being persecuted and he was being chased. He was being ostracized. But at some point, as he was sitting down, huddled in the forest, uh, scratching out this psalm to God, it no longer became his story about himself but became a prophecy about the character and the heart of the Messiah that the Messiah would be one whose zeal would eat him up passion would consume him zeal means excitement of the mind fierce enthusiasm fervor of the spirit not tame savage that's what this word means in the original language of Scripture in Greek. It comes from the Greek word, or the root Greek word of zelos, is zeo, which literally means to boil with heat. To make liquids boil or solids glow with heat. The zeo for your house has eaten me up. It's a picture of a person. That on the deep insides of their soul, they are on fire for something. And the riveting, arresting potency of Jesus cleansing the temple is not found in the power of the whip. It's not found in the flip of the tables. It's not found in the splintering of cages. 
What arrested the temple that day was not the words that Jesus said alone, but it was how he said them and the, and the feeling that came and emanated from his being when he said them. It was his passion that captured his attention. And when passion consumed Jesus, he would not be deterred. When passion consumed Jesus, he was willing to be forsaken. He was willing to endure pain. He was willing to go through punishment. He was willing to be a public spectacle. He was willing to act without regard for the consequence. When passion consumed Jesus, he was all in. There was no outs. He was 100% in. But the question then is begged of us. What in the world was Jesus passionate about? Well, as we keep reading through the story, we discover because the Pharisees come and they meet Jesus after he has driven those animals out. And as the money is scattered around his feet and the tables are up on their, la- up on their, on their back, their legs are in the air, they sneeringly come up to him and go, who gave you the right to do this? Show us a miracle, buddy. Prove yourself, Jesus. Show us that you have the authority to do what you just did. And Jesus, with sweat dripping off his brow, his chest heaving from the exertion, his robe no doubt askew, he simply answers to them in verse 20 and verse 19, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, 40 and six years was this temple in building. And wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When they came to Jesus with a sneer on their lips and acidity in their voice, going, who are you to do this here? What power or what authority do you stand on to do this here? Jesus, still white hot, still consumed with passion about lost people being blocked from the presence of God, being blocked from forgiveness. He doesn't answer them. He doesn't show them a trick. He doesn't raise a man from the dead. He doesn't make water turn into more wine like he did three verses earlier. He gives them a response but because he is still so consumed he can only speak of Calvary he says you hear me right now you put all the barriers up that you want you try and stop these people from coming to God you try to put barriers up to the maimed and the blind the outsiders and the broken if you think this is too much wait till you see what I do when you destroy this temple you tear this temple down but in three days I will raise it up. Kill me if you want to. But in three days, I'm coming back again. Crucify me on the cross if you like. But in three days, I'm coming back because you are never going to block another person from mercy. You're never going to stop another person from grace. You will never block another outsider from redemption ever again. He answered them with Calvary because he was consumed with passion. He was passionate about all people from everywhere of all nations coming to know the Lord. Look at John 2.15 again. It says he drove them out. The same verb used in 2.15 is the same verb used throughout the entire New Testament. To describe the casting out of demons. He drove those animals and those money changers out. John chose to use the same word that he would use to describe. When Jesus cast legions of evil spirits 
out of men and put them in pigs. Jesus hurled those same tables with the same thundering force that would cause the demons that filled Mary Magdalene to tremble. He hurled those money changing weights and tables with the same thundering authority that he did when he met the two demoniacs of Gadarenes because like an officer desperate to get home to her babies our God is a God of passion Jesus is a God of passion and our God is passionate about people God is passionate about people this is not the only example and I know I've got to hurry but he stands up on the day of the feast the Bible says and cries out with a loud voice if any man thirsts let him come unto me and drink he breaks the formality of a holiday festival because he was so moved he was so moved by the spiritual poverty of the people that were in front of them People that had religion, but they had no move of God. People that had traditions, but they did not know what it meant to be loved by God. People that had had all sorts of habits and festivals and behaviors. He was so moved with reaching them with his power and with his presence that he interrupts the formality to give them an opportunity to come to him. We find him again in Luke 5,000 people are in the wilderness and he sees them as scattered sheep without a shepherd. He sees that they're hungry and it's hot. And you turn and you say, somebody get me some food for these people. Somebody get me some food. Look at them. Look at their needs. Look, they're scattered. Look, they're my people and they're wandering out there and they're hungry. They're looking, they've come all the way out of the desert from me and they're starving. Somebody get me some bread. Somebody and the pragmatic disciples speak up and they say, we don't have enough money. We cannot even imagine how much money it would take to feed 5,000 people. And he's like, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. Get me some food. Is there anybody here that has food? And somebody brings up a little boy with five loaves and two fish. And not like Dempster loaves, they're like dinner rolls. But Jesus, so moved, takes that lunch and he blesses it. And he starts ripping the food into manageable pieces, miraculously multiplying. Those lows until not just those 5,000 men are filled, but every man, woman, and child that is there is filled. And not only is there enough to go around, he can understand Jesus. He's God. He's got all authority. He knows the end from the beginning, which means he would know the appropriate portion sizing for all of those individuals. But there is overflow. There's, there's 12 baskets left over. Jesus made more than enough. Why would he do that? Because I believe he was passionate about those people he was moved with compassion for those people the Lord is driven by passion not instability of emotions but a heart that is consumed with passion there is a rawness to God in the Bible and the way he acts as wise as he is as intelligent as he is as sovereign as he is when he moves towards people the God of heaven becomes untamed when God moves in the direction of people when he sees their needs he becomes untamed there is a wild side to God to the untrained eye it's almost reckless it's like an unbridled horse that's in the wilderness. You mean to tell me God the maker of heaven and earth yes the God the all wise and knowing one yes when God in the Bible meets the needs of human hearts. There is a restlessness that comes over him. There is a rawness that comes over him. And we find a God that moves so methodically and so rationally in every other arena in which he functions. When he comes in front of the needs of people and the opposition that is stopping him from meeting their needs, he will do whatever it takes. He will do whatever it takes. He'll send people across the earth to preach the gospel he'll wake saints up in the middle of a perfectly good sleep in the middle of the night to compel them to pray he will allow 
sociopathic Roman soldiers to strip him naked, to strip him bare, to beat him to a pulp, to spit and pull his beard, to mock the name that is above every name. Why would he do that? Why would he, for the joy that was set before him, endure the cross and at the same time disregard the shame? Because God is consumed with passion to reach people. He is consumed with passion to reach people. And since God is passionate, passion gets God's attention. Since God is passionate, passion gets God's attention. I draw your attention to Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. One day Jesus told his disciples... A story to show that they should always pray and never give up. There was a judge in a certain city, he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. And a widow of that city came to him repeatedly saying, Give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. And the judge, the Bible says, ignored her for a while. But finally he said, I don't fear God or care about people. But this woman is driving me crazy. I am going to see that she gets justice. Because she is wearing me out with her constant requests. Then the Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think. God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night. Will he keep putting them off? Hallelujah. Ah, He will keep putting them off. I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find? Will he find many on the earth who have faith? Hear me, God. God is moved with passion towards you. And what will move God towards you specifically is when he finds that quality within himself and people that are in this room tonight. He said if an evil man will eventually answer someone who doesn't pray or someone who does not give up, how much more will a God who is moved with compassion move towards you if you won't give up? And you keep on asking. But he then ends with the question, when I come, will I find people who are passionate about experiencing me like I am answering their prayer? Will I find people that are consumed with as much desire to meet with me as I am with them? Because hear me, God can work with all kinds of people. He can work with the broken. He can work with the flawed. He can work with those with sin in their life. He can work with people that don't have everything together. He'll work with the most imperfect individual around. But he cannot work with or even respond to apathy. God despises apathy. That's why in Revelation he says, Because you're neither hot nor cold but lukewarm. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. See, God, as passionate as he is, As desirous as he is to meet with you, he cannot deal with tepid attitudes and meh spirits. But to those who are hungry for God, to those who are desperate for God, to those who are passionate to be in the presence of God, God moves in response to passion when you are consumed with passion to receive from him. When you are consumed with passion to receive from him, something inside of you connects with something inside of him. And when someone comes to an altar and says, I will not be deterred. When someone comes to 
to an altar and says, God, I'm here again. When someone lifts their hands in a church service and says, I don't care who looks. I don't care who sees. I don't care if I cry. Oh, God, I'm hungry for you. God hears that prayer. When somebody comes to the church and they say, Lord, this week I have fallen and I've made mistakes. But, Lord, I want to meet with you. Let your grace come in me again. Let your mercy come in me again. Lord, redeem me one more time. God will move in your direction. God will hear your prayer. Hear me, you don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have it all figured out. You just need to be passionate for God. And God will go right there. That's someone I can meet with. I got something in common with you. When you are willing to worship at the top of your lungs, when you'll cry out to God, when you'll dance and you'll jump and you'll shout and you'll sing, and say, God, I'm hungry for you. God, I want you in my life. So how does God respond? What does God do when we are passionate for Him? Like He is passionate for us. We know God is always reaching. We know God wants there to be no barrier. We know God is not cold and not distant. But what happens when He finds in common with you? What exists within himself towards you. What does God do when we are passionate for him? Like he is passionate for us. I'll tell you what he does. God responds with miracles. God responds with a life-changing encounter with his spirit. I want you to listen as I make my point in Luke chapter 11, verse 9 and 10 and verse 13. I will tell you, Jesus is stuck on this. Keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And everyone who knocks the door will be opened. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, if you who are flawed and you who are broken, the people that don't always have the right filter, the people who don't always act with integrity, if if your child comes to you, Jesus says, and he asks for bread, will you give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, will you give him a snake? If you being evil, if when you look in the mirror, you know there are times you don't have it all together. But if you who don't have it all together, if you that still have some sin lingering in your life, you know how to respond with mercy to your children when they ask. If all of a sudden all of that junk and now Nastiness melts away from your spirit and you are moved with compassion towards your own children. How much more does your heavenly father want to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him, hear me. When you respond with passion, God will respond to you with the miraculous. When you respond back with passion and you say, God, I'm not going to give up. God, I'm not going to stop. God, I'm not going to quit praying. He will do whatever it takes. He'll cause rain to fall. He'll make the sun stand still. He'll multiply bread and fish. He'll stop the natural course of death. He'll add years to your life. He'll make cancer disappear. He'll provide power. He'll provide favor. He'll meet your needs. He'll meet your needs of your family. He'll save your backslidden children. He'll change your life. He'll heal you of your bitterness. And He will even fill you. With the Holy Ghost, God is reaching right now in this room with all His might. God is here right now in this room. Musicians, come, I'm going to quit. God is reaching with all of His might in this room. God, with all of the force of heaven, is straining towards what is happening in this room right now. With all of the passion He can muster. With the same passion that consumed Him to tip over tables so the outsiders could get in touch with God. God is here by His Holy Spirit. 
and he's reaching for people. He's reaching for people that need a miracle in their life. He's reaching for people that have loved ones who are sick and they've tried everything but there is no answer. He's looking for families that need a miracle in, a provision in their life. He's looking for people that need healing in their mind, that need healing in their souls, that need healing in their body. And he's reaching with passion. If we could see him physically, he would be clothed the very same way he was in John 2. There'd be sweat on his brow. His chest would be heaving. His heart would be pounding because with all of the might he can muster, with all of the power of heaven behind him, he is reaching for people in this room. And so my message is passion has consumed Jesus. So let passion for Jesus consume you. Return passion with passion and you will see the hand of the Lord. Lift your hands to the Lord Jesus right now. Come on, that's it all over this room, all over this place. Lift your hands. Return passion for passion. Return desire for desire. Hunger for hunger. And you will see the hand of the Lord. Is there anyone here tonight? They would stand at their feet and say, God, I'm in your presence. And I refuse to be denied. Lord, I know you love me with all of your heart. I know you love me with all of your soul. We got Dan standing, Dan Marshall in the back. God reached for you when you were a mess. When your life was broken, God brought all of heaven in your direction to rescue you from sin. Is there anybody here today? Beverly, she's standing. And God reached for you a couple of years ago and He pulled you out of that backslidden state. And now you're saying, God, I want to return passion for passion. I want to return heart for heart because I know when I do, I'm going to see your hand in my life. Is there anyone here? God, I refuse to be denied. Is there anyone here like blind Bartimaeus that know that Jesus is passing by? And you'll say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy. Have mercy on me. God, I will not be denied. God, I'm not going to stop seeking. Is there anybody, you need a miracle of healing in your body. Or you need God to work a miracle in your family. That you would stand to your feet right now as a testimony of your hunger and desire to see the Lord. Say, Jesus, I'm desperate for you. Lord, you've reached for me. I'm reaching back. If I could have our ministry team join me here, let's all stand to our feet. I preach the word of the Lord. What God gave me this afternoon. And I wrote three sentences before I walked out into worship service. And these three, they're actually not even sentences, they're three phrases. And that is release the gifts of the Spirit. Call for the ministry team to pray the prayer of faith. And to command those that come. When the name of Jesus is spoken over them, the moment they hear his name, to lift their hands and to lose themselves in passionate worship to God. To not request, to not beg, to not plead, for your heavenly Father already knows everything that you need. God already knows. Do you hear me? Do you understand that? God already knows. Jesus already knows what you need. You don't have to convince Him. You don't have to tell Him. Before you ever utter a prayer, before you ever woke up this morning, God looked at your life and said, this is what they need. And tonight I'm going to give it to them. Tonight I'm going to respond to them. Tonight I'm going to return passion for passion. And I'm going to pour my presence out on their life and change it. Here's what I want you to do. The gift of faith is now working in this room. If you have a pressing need in your life 
and you are hungry for God, I want you to come and stand in front of one of these ministers right now. If you need God to move in your life, we got one that's coming. I know I'm, this is putting everybody on the spot. But passion, passion says I don't care who sees. Passion says I don't care who looks. That's it. That's it. Just go and stand in front of one of these ministers. When we pray for your need, when I say in the name of Jesus, I want you to worship the Lord. I want you to not worry. God already knows what you need. That's it. The Lord spoke to me a month ago. I'm going to pray in a moment. I'm giving more opportunity. The Lord spoke to me a month ago and said, I'm getting ready to pour out miracles. But he said, get ready. There are going to be people that are going to get sick. There are people that are going to get bad reports from the doctor. And I want you to tell them this sickness is not unto death. But so that the glory of God can be revealed. I'm hearing you. There are people here. God wants you to know that he is letting you walk through the fire so that when he delivers you, everyone, everyone around you that needs to come to faith in Jesus will see and believe what God has done in your life. The gift of faith is here. If you have faith, I want you to stretch your hands towards. If the spouses of our ministers, the spouses of our ministers, if applicable, can come. I'm going to pray the prayer of faith. And I want you to come behind these people and lay your hands on them. By the authority of the Word of God. By the blood that was shed on Calvary. By the authority in the name of Jesus. I release the gift of healing. I release the working of miracles. And I release, oh God, the gift of the discerning of spirits into this room. You said that by laying on of hands, the prayer of faith will save the sick. We are here, oh God, praying that prayer. And we believe that you are going to answer by the authority of the name of Jesus. By the power of the blood of Jesus. Receive miracles in this room right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I want you to worship. Lift your voice in worship. The Lord is here. The Lord